This is a panel on educational use cases for annotation. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Five years ago, I presented at the first I Annotate. I was less than five months out of a position teaching high school English. I was uh, working for Rap Genius. I was representing Rap Genius at the time. They had hired me to be the first director of education there. Um, and it was a pretty crazy time, a pretty crazy idea for, and I was just hacking the Rap Genius platform for my English courses. And it turns out that both, and then here we are with learning scientists five years later, you know, uh, presenting their research on annotation in the classroom. So uh, we've come a long way since then. Um, but both with Rap Genius and with Hypothesis, really from the start, neither was created as an educational platform. But from the start with both, teachers and educators gra you know, gravitated towards these platforms uh, to use as teaching and learning tools. I think it's a pretty obvious use case. Uh, the idea that a teacher wants to you know, see that their, their students has, have read, uh, hopefully engaged uh, somewhat deeply in, in their reading, and, and collaborated and you know, corresponded with their classmates about that uh, reading. One way that I think about this now that we've sort of entered into the ed tech space formally uh, at Hypothesis is uh, the discussion forum. The discussion forum is kind of like the entry level piece of education technology that sort of any teacher can understand. It's a place where you can sort of post a prompt and have students respond. And I think uh, collaborative annotation, hypothesis, and other platforms are more organic and authentic ways to have students engaging with course content uh, and with each other. But it's actually a lot, it's a lot deeper than that. One way that I've been thinking about it, speculating as a non-learning specialist recently is that it makes visible certain pieces of the learning process that are normally hidden both to students and to teachers. Uh, the note-taking process, the process of, of you know, comprehending meaning in a text, the process of beginning to analyze that meaning, the collaborative process of creating meaning with others. All these things are not easy to see in a normal, the way a normal classroom is run. Um, so I'm very excited today to have some learning scientists and uh, experts in, in literacy to help us begin to, to see how we can, uh, how, how, how students are learning with uh, collaborative annotation technology, uh, what kind of learning happens, and how these learnings can inform the way that we teach and the way that we design education technologies. I'm going to let each of them sort of introduce themselves after that general introduction, and we're going to start with Michelle Sprouse from the University of Michigan. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Sprouse and I'm currently a PhD student in English and Education at the University of Michigan. I'm really happy to be here today to share some of my work on social annotation and graduate student reading practices. I've made my presentation and speaker's notes available. Um, they, you can access the link in the I Annotate program um, and access the PDF. Feel free to access those notes um, if it will make my talk more accessible for you today. I also want to invite you to connect with me on Twitter. My handle is at Michelle Sprouse. Our panel will speak today on three themes, design, learning, and innovation. I hope for you to take away from my presentation some design possibilities for qualitative interpretive studies of annotation practices and clear connections to literacy learning. As far as innovation, I'm not sure how qualified I am to speak. 30 years ago in this state, there was another conference on annotation called Annotation and its Texts. Uh, there were scholars from across the humanities and social sciences, all of them men, unfortunately, who shared their work on annotation practices which stretched as far back as dry point annotations just barely etched onto early English manuscripts. At most, the social annotation I will describe today these practices are just a digital remix of the things that we've been doing as long as we've been writing in English. Recently, I've been working with undergraduate students, and I'd like to share with you an excerpt from a text I often assign to them as they begin working on a research paper. Mark Geipa offers a ballroom metaphor to help composition students imagine entering academic discourse. He writes, first they have to enter the room and discern what the critics inside are already saying then they have to evaluate the arguments and make some judgments about the position of authors and arguments in the critical terrain. And finally, they need to discover where in the conversation they can step in. I appreciate much about his metaphor and use it with my undergraduate students to help them understand why and how to incorporate source material into their research writing. 
Yet while the same metaphor of a ballroom conversation would likely seem relevant to doctoral students like me, many of us who are hoping to participate in academic discourse, it might be a bit too sedate for the lived experience of graduate work. As a current PhD student, I feel more like I am sprinting to catch a moving train. The conversations I hope to join seem to be already barreling down the tracks, not ensconced within some elegant ballroom. Much of getting on this train seems to depend on my literacy practices, how I write and read. So I'm sprinting alongside the train, desperately reading, writing, and conferencing, hello, I annotate, to grasp some handle that will allow me to drag myself up. Fortunately, my professors, many of them safe in their tenured cars, are coaching and encouraging me along. I'm also not alone in my attempt to catch on to this fast-moving locomotive. In fact, my fellow graduate students are running beside me, or as one of my colleagues suggested when I shared this metaphor, furiously pumping a hand car behind the train. But what if I were not grasping at this train only for myself, but also for and with my colleagues? What if we were throwing ropes with which we might knit a net to help carry all of us along? I want to imagine social annotation as hooks and grapples and lines we can attach to text in the form of marginal comments shared among a group, helping my colleagues and me to increase our connections and facilitate our climb aboard the moving discourse together. Today I will share the results of a study I completed this year on social annotation in a small graduate study course. I'll discuss the ways that social annotation helped us to try to catch the moving train and also the ways social annotation sometimes tangled up our feet. For those in the room who are educators, my hope is that you'll leave with an understanding of what students might be doing behind the scenes of the classroom as they work with social annotation in their reading and writing practices. And for those of you who are designing tools for annotation, I hope you'll leave with an understanding of how those tools might both enable and constrain literacy practices. But before I get into the details of my study, I want to create a shared definition with you of a key term that will help to situate my work. The term I want to define is in the title of my presentation, transcontextualization. Brandt and Clinton describe transcontextualization in this way, as certain kinds of undeniable capacities, particularly a capacity to travel, a capacity to stay intact, and a capacity to be visible and animate outside the interactions of immediate literacy events. Where it might be easy, if perhaps a bit old school, to think of literacy expertise as an individual's ability to comprehend and compose texts, this concept of transcontextualization trans helps us to see that expertise is really about movement, movement across moments of reading and writing, across texts, across oral and written discourse. And it's not just about an individual's thinking. Literacy is social practice, embedded in technologies that Brandt and Clinton remind us are also worth understanding. Attributing literacy to objects, they argue, allows us to see, quote, literacy as something is still there when the people around it are gone. Indeed, given that the summative assessments for masters and doctoral programs are written texts in the form of theses and dissertations, which demonstrate a student's ability to participate in ongoing discourse through original research, we need to look beyond easy to quantify measures of social annotation, like comprehension and critical thinking scores, to examine other potential benefits. I argue that for graduate students, the purposes for reading are not to comprehend a text in isolation, but to move that text into spoken and written social discourse. Okay, I hope I've thrown enough ropes for everyone in the room to catch a hold of the literacy goals I'm proposing for myself and my fellow graduate students. I will now outline the design of my qualitative interpretive study of graduate reading practices. This study took place at a large Midwestern university. I'm sorry, there are no bonus points if you can guess the institution. The three participants in this study and I were enrolled in a graduate level small group study course. Before the semester began, we proposed reading lists for our independent study and the instructor suggested additional texts, typically one each week, that we would all read together. Our group met in person for a weekly one hour discussion. Based on my prior work with social annotation as a middle school English teacher and a college writing instructor, I suggested we use hypothesis to socially annotate the shared text in preparation for discussion. My colleagues agreed to use hypothesis for social annotation during our group study.
This study builds on my previous research by looking at how graduate students read in a small group independent study course, which again uses hypothesis for social annotation. However, whereas my previous research focused on the content of annotations across all texts read in the course, this particular study focuses on participants' reading of a single text, as I simultaneously aim for a more ecological approach to understanding participants' reading and annotation practices from their perspectives. That is, by selecting a single literacy object as the central focus, I make room for a more inclusive analysis of how the participants reflect on their practices during a retrospective think aloud protocol. My primary data sources for this study are video recordings of retrospective think aloud protocols based on the screen captures and videos of participants' original reading events. To create rich data of participants' reading practices around a shared docu document, I also archived participant digital and analog annotations, archived any additional notes they made, and my field notes from original readings in-class discussions, and our, their res retrospective think aloud protocols. While the participants completed the original reading, I recorded jottings, which I later used to write more detailed feed notes, field notes to recreate narratives of each reading and to record questions to ask during the retrospective think aloud protocols. Following each reading, I combined the two or three recordings into a single split screen video for each participant. I used each video to create a time-stamped outline of the reading session and then integrated specific and general questions from my field notes. I'm sorry, I'm trying to scroll down my notes here. I've lost my cursor. After the in-class discussion, I scheduled a retrospective think aloud protocol with each participant. With the compiled video of the participant's original reading on my laptop, I set up another screen capture. I gave each participant control of the laptop to start and stop the video as necessary and asked them to walk me through their thinking while reading. At times, I asked questions about particular actions that I observed or for more general reflections. Again, I made jottings during the Think Aloud protocols. Afterwards, I transcribed each retrospective Think Aloud. I included in the transcripts my questions and participants' verbal responses and explanations. I did not transcribe the actions they made to interact with the video recordings. However, I did use the screen capture to determine when students were quoting from the original text or their own annotations and indicated those instances in the transcript. I provided the full transcripts to participants for member checking before drafting the case studies. I asked participants if they had any corrections or if they wanted any content excluded from the study. I also archived all the shared annotations from my hypothesis by downloading them as HTML files. The HTML files included the participant's username, participant selected excerpts from the assigned text, their annotations for each excerpt, and the time and date of the annotations. I began my analysis by coding those think aloud transcripts and paper digital and social annotations made by each participant. I then drafted a case for each participant and emailed them a copy of their case for member checking. With each case, I asked if they were, there were any elements which the participant wanted removed or changed before I shared the draft with others. Each helped me to construct also an accurate summary of their educational and professional background. No participant asked for any substantive changes to the presentation of their case. And then after member checking, I began a process of analytic induction with the goal of developing a framework for focus coding. I exported the open codes to a mind mapping program and began to group them into broad categories which reflected the topics participants most frequently discussed in the Think Aloud protocols. Um, and these included managing the textual environment, time, purposes, and the conversations happening in the margins of the text. This helped me to conceptualize participants' own understandings of their reading practices as fitting into a sort of ecosystem of reading and annotating the purposes and goals which shift for each individual during the reading event. Also significant to the participants was the materiality of their reading practices as they were sponsored, which in Deborah Brandt's terms means both enabling and constrained um, particular ways of reading. With an evolving set of research questions and an emerging understanding of how participants were making meaning from their reading and annotation practices, I returned to the literacy literature previously described. In rereading Branton Clinton's The Limits of the Local, I found their argument that, quote, literacy as a something is still there when people around it are gone, 
resonated with my participants' descriptions of their own annotation practices. And as such, I drafted a second conceptual map which merged the open codes I had previously generated and Brant and Clinton's framework, which I used to move up a level of abstraction into category, categorizing these open codes in terms of sponsors, practices, and trans contextualizations. Using this framework, I returned to the transcripts and archived their annotations for focus coding. And my codebook divided each of these broad concepts into several categories, often expressed in terms of alternative possibilities. Today, I want to focus on sharing how the graduate student readers describe transcontextualization in their reading practices through localizing moves, globalizing connects, and fold folding in. Localizing moves define a practice and meaning in a local space. And I have an example I want to share with you. One participant explained, and so in my mind, this must be very important to her because she noted it in her introduction, and then she used it as bolded headings. So these are kind of like the three main sites that I'll be looking at when she makes her argument. Globalizing connects connect a global literacy practice to a distant context. An example is, and I think one thing that struck me about this, just in relation to other kinds of coursework that I'm doing this semester, is that we see a lot of this kind of transcription with italization and bolding in discourse analysis. And so I think it's kind, not easier, but well, yeah, it's a little bit easier for me to understand it from that point of view. And finally, folding in, which collapses the space between literacy sponsorship of humans and objects. I like that you could respond to another person's comment with a comment, and that is something that I both like and dislike about discussion boards, for example. Now that you have some sense of how I collected and analyzed my data, I'd like to share with you an overview of the four cases of graduate readers before digging into the patterns that identify um, across our individual and social annotations. My first reader is Alex, who, unlike the other readers in this study, made all of his annotations directly into the shared space through a hypothesis. And he talked about allowing himself to, quote, read in the zone without pausing to annotate with this goal of sharing the marginal space. But his awareness of audience seemed to constrain his highlighting and annotation practices and limited the number of times that he interacted with the text. Lexi did not participate through writing social annotations during most of our semester together, but she did more passively read the comments left by her peers in the group. While she characterizes these actions as, quote, selfish, her responses reveal the tensions between the simultaneously enabling and constraining sponsorship of technology in shaping reading practices. Where the technology may afford a desirable way of reading, it also bears demands of time for learning and implementing that new technology. And Lexi, for much of that semester, acted agentively to appropriate only those affordances most useful given her situation. Sarah anticipated ongoing conversations, both in those shared margins and subsequent class discussions. In considering how her classmates would read her hypothesis annotations, Sarah also thought ahead to how she might be called on to elaborate on that commentary in future class discussions as part of her selection process for what to socially annotate. However, in this particular text that, we, that I, was the focus for my study, she did not describe any particular benefits for sharing annotations. And she attributed part of this to her practice of not carrying her laptop to campus and therefore not having, to, having access to the shared annotations during class discussions. And part to the constraints of time, which did often not allow her um, an opportunity to read her peers' last minute annotations before the class discussion. Unfortunately, though she labored for 20 minutes after reading to create hypothesis annotations in this case, they were not taken up in replies or the subsequent discussion. And finally, a little bit about me. While I didn't record my reading for a full retrospective think aloud, I did archive my own annotations. I made those annotations in both an independent space and in hypothesis like, Alexi, like Lexi and Sarah. Four days before our scheduled group meeting, I read at home using another digital annotation app on my iPad. And as I read, I highlighted sentences and phrases in the text to which I added 14 color-coded marginal notes. I waited to make the hypothesis annotations until closer to the date of our discussion to mimic how I would normally participate in our small group annotations. Here, I use the coded annotations, both individual and social, to trace moves into and out of the reading events. Participants made visible their cognitive work during their reading primarily through annotations and note taking, which I coded to trace transcontextualizations. Most often, I identified localized localizing moves such as marking the text, labeling, and summarizing. 
Less frequently, but still evident across all participants, were folding in by asking questions, commenting and quoting, and globalizing connects in the form of an in the form of collaboration with peers, connecting to another text, personal experience, or another discourse. Annotation can collapse the space between literacy events and people by encoding some of the thoughts participants have while reading, immediately after reading. Even in the individually annotated documents, participants asked questions and commented to engage with the author, who has already been folded into the original text. Participants fixed their constructed meanings into the margins for their future selves, and sometimes, in the case of social annotation, fixed their interactions with other readers as well. All participants asked questions and offered critical responses as concrete practices that collapsed the spaces between author and reader, the time between writing, reading, and rereading. However, this folding in of discussion into the social margins can also constrain participation. Neither Lexi nor Sarah achieved the consistency that Alex sought in social annotation. Though Sarah began the semester engaged in social annotation, her practice stopped when the, the ways to access hypothesis changed, and she was unable to continue her practices for social annotation until I met with her and helped her one-on-one -on -one to, to begin again with social annotation. And this left both Sarah and Lexi somewhat outside the discussion constraining their participation in our shared practices. Despite the eight degrees and more than 40 years of teaching English that I shared with my, my colleagues, all of us seem to wonder about the effectiveness of our own work under the constraints of time. For Alex, Lexi, and Sarah, the time required for reading was a concern which shaped their metacognitive and reflective practices. Alex dealt with the demands on his time by reading more quickly than the others and by accepting, quote, there are some things I'm not going to absorb in my reading. And he was learning to be okay with that. Alex chose to, quote, just move forward with the readings and did not encode many of his in-the-moment thoughts. The result was a less metacognitively aware reading where though his eyes were more focused on the page and he was not aware of the fact of his reading. Without much of his thinking encoded on the page, Alex found it very difficult in our retrospective think aloud protocol to talk about or recall or explain what's going on in his practices. Lexi and Sarah, however, chose to prioritize their individual annotations on paper, and they encoded many of their thoughts in Mark's summary and commentary that would make more visible their thinking across a longer stretch of time. Where Alex struggled to recall his thoughts, both Lexi and Sarah were able to use their encoded thoughts to more fluently reflect on their particular reading actions. I'd like to end with this note about how social annotation can both help and hinder our attempts to catch the moving train. As a practice, it may help students to reflect on their responses to texts and the lenses they bring to reading through engagement and comparison with others. However, by itself, it may constrain visibly, metacognitively aware reading practices, which might otherwise allow readers to evaluate the particular reading actions which shape their literacy practices. Rather than replacing independent annotations, we might think of social annotation as an addition to complement readers' existing practices. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ramey Collier. I'm an assistant professor of learning technologies at the University of Colorado in Denver. And this afternoon, I'm joined by... I'm Francisco Perez. I'm a PhD student at the University of Colorado, Denver. And so this afternoon, we'll be speaking for about 20 minutes about analyzing and visualizing open data to support educator learning. And our Twitter handles are there. We have put on the agenda for the day the uh, website that we're affiliated with, a project called The Marginal Syllabus, and a link into a specific dashboard that we'll be showing you. Additionally, you can find that information here. So short bit.ly link. We're pronouncing this crowd layers, which may ring a bell for us who are thinking about how groups of people come together and collaboratively add layers of discourse to documents. Our crowd layers dashboard is the focus of our conversation today. 
Again, links to this have been provided through a comment on our program. A bit of brief background about the marginal syllabus. Uh, this is an effort that is now in its, going into its third year, and this is not a random picture of educators from, you know, some image, whatever. This is actually, I'm in the background there. These are my dear colleagues who are having a conversation. And that's, again, the purpose of this effort. The marginal syllabus, and that's our website there, is a means of bringing educators together to have consequential conversations around content that they care about. And this project over the past few years now has grown to become a collaboration with folks in this room. We've received wonderful support and all kinds of encouragement and guidance from Hypothesis, and also now the National Writing Project, which is the nation's largest facilitator of both K-12 and higher ed facing literacy professional learning. And with this partnership team and the Educator Innovator, which is one of their kind of education facing innovative initiatives, We've put together, again, an effort that is utilizing open web annotation to convene and sustain conversations with educators about equity in teaching, in learning, and in education. And that focus on equity for us is really quite important. These are not public conversations amongst educators who are discussing classroom management or instructional strategies about a specific discipline, but these are actually conversations that are rooted in discussions about educational equity which allows us to play with the idea of the marginal in a variety of important ways, which I think is very important to emphasize in introducing this effort. And so, first and foremost, we're engaging with marginal perspectives. The educators who voluntarily participate in this effort are engaging with perspectives, with texts, and with authors that are, in some ways, contrary to dominant education narratives. We might think of these as counter-narratives to the kind of status quo about teaching and learning. In addition to these marginal perspectives, we're also working within marginal discursive spaces, again, not unlike what Michelle was just speaking to us about a few moments ago, and that the educators who are having conversations are doing so in the margins of online text, and again, that's being mediated by hypothesis. And finally, and, and Jeremy Dean has been helpful in you know, encouraging us to think about uh, this, we're also using, for many educators, what might be considered a marginal technology. Many educators are not using open source technologies. Many educators are not working openly or with such social reading practices. And so to adopt a tool, in this case hypothesis, is really on the kind of margins of formal educational technology. And we think it's important to support educators in using this kind of open source technology for their learning. I want to briefly give a shout out to, again, some collaborative work that I've done with Jeremy over the past few years now. We've put some of this work uh, into writing, go figure. Uh, we've recently had an article published in the Disrupted Journal of Media Practice on web annotation as both conversation and interruption. Again, you can access the article. There's a brief link there. And we make the argument in this case that for educators in particular, there are some everyday media practices as well as some disruptive media practices that open annotation really helps us to capture and to propel these kinds of openly networked, interest-driven, and professionally relevant communities forward. So again, I would highly encourage you to read that uh, publication. I'll just briefly mention as regards to the marginal syllabus project that these are a brief, here's a, just a brief snapshot of some of our participation patterns. In our, our pilot year in 2016-17, we had nine conversations, these were monthly, so we would have a partner author, we would have a open access text, we would invite educators to essentially gather together over a certain period of time and begin to socially read and annotate that text together. And during the 2016-17 year, we averaged about 18 participants and 141 annotations per conversation. And in this past academic year, the average participation has been just a little lower at 16 educators per conversation and about 113 annotations. Again, this is spanning both K-12 and higher ed. And as we've seen this work unfold, we've begun to ask ourselves questions not only about individual educators and their participation in these openly networked spaces, but about how educators are collaborating with one another and the social practices that are mediated by hypothesis annotation as a support for professionally relevant learning. We've also been quite curious about some of the technical workflows that can help us to capture and report data about this project. And so with that brief introduction, I'm going to turn this over to Francisco, who has been leading our data analytics efforts around, again, capturing and reporting data. And he's going to talk to us about some of the learning analytics and the processes that have now begun to carry our project forward. So I was, I was 
brought onto this project to uh, take a uh, computer science approach to how to analyze the data that's generated through this project, through the participants and their interactions. And um, from speaking with a, a number of folks here, I think um, a, a, they've been surprised to know that simply from using the data set that Hypothesis generates, um, we've been able to, to build and, and write a number of uh, scholarly works uh, simply from the Hypothesis data, no, no joining to external data sets or anything. And I think that's a, that's a huge credit to, to their organization and really thinking about um, and anticipating what needs for educators, um, what, what, what the educators' needs will be, um, and, and capturing that data um, from their system. So in 2011, uh, Tanya Eli Elias uh, asked the question, um, what interactions are effective in learning, and how can they be improved? So in capturing those interactions, uh, we developed a, a number of tests using um, typical you know, business intelligence methods um, to really see the interactions. And, and here we have a number of samples. Uh, we see interactions between, with the, with the diagram in the middle, the interactions between the participants in this project. And this is all, these graphs are all generated from the data produced in the marginal syllabus. Um, so we see how, how we can graph interactions of participants with each other. Um, we can see how to graph interactions of participants with the source document. And we also see how to graph and analyze um, interactions of participants through time. And, and all these methods uh, allow us to uh, really dig into um, you know, a variety of research questions uh, relating to this project. And so for the remainder of this uh, presentation, I'm gonna go um, kind of just briefly uh, go over some of the different analytic products that we developed and that we've been uh, using to write our, our papers, just like I said, through the, through the hypothesis uh, data. And then at the end, we're gonna do um, a live demo of a, of a, of a dashboard that we developed um, that's hopefully in assistance uh, for the participants of this project. So the first, the first process in the uh, analytic method, the data analytic methods, is usually to collect the data. And because Hypothesis has um, such a rich data set and they make it really easy to access, this was really simple to do. Um, simply just query, query the Hypothesis API and collect the data. Oh, and, and that reference field that, that you all include into uh, the data set, that's brilliant. Seriously, it's helped out so much, so thank you. So we began with an exploratory analysis uh, just on participation. Um, essentially, that's just measuring and quantifying how participants are interacting within one another and just taking uh, cursory methods or cursory analytics, simply um, you know, aggregating, filtering, that sort of stuff. And then we moved on to um, the second phase, which would be more complex and comprehensive statistical methods. Um, back to that uh, paper that I initially referenced, uh, Tanya Elias, she mentioned, she describes the analytical process, the learning analytic process, in a number of phases. Um, so phase one would be the collection and descriptive analysis, so essentially the process by which you collect that data um, many times there are multiple sources of that data, but um, luckily for us, we've, we've gotten um, so much usage out of just that single data set that we haven't really needed to um, you know, branch out and look for external sources of data. Um, the second phase is statistical analysis. Um, so I'll show you here a little later how we've used statistical methods to um, draw uh, like heat maps on documents to show where uh, participants are mainly focusing their, doc their, their annotations and their participation on. Also, another statistical analysis that we did um, was uh, with regards to um, topic modeling, which is essentially taking a corpus of text and finding topics using uh, the series of weights and, 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 and processes. And then finally, um, on to phase three, 
which has been uh, this tool that we developed called Crowd Layers. And essentially, what the Crowd Layers platform uh, was designed for is to really take the analytic products that at first only existed on my PC. So the way we would share our findings was through papers and, and, and journals, right? But, um, so the process with, involved with that would be to run the analytic process on my PC, um, take those graphs, take those diagrams, and then you know, put them on a document and hopefully get published, right? So with crowd layers, what we're trying to go for is to um, replace that analytic product with an analytic pipeline, something that's automated, um, something that runs real time, and something that um, really gives our, our processes um, you know, daylight, really shines daylight on the analytic product processes that we use. Um, I think um, it's an important way of, of holding ourselves accountable uh, to our participants because um, we're really showing what we're doing with their data. You know, we're being open and we're being um, transparent with how we're processing their data and what we're doing with it. So the, the first paper that we worked on um, was primarily just the descriptive statistics. And, and as you see here, this, uh, this column chart, this uh, stacked column chart just shows um, how participants um, interact with one another. So um, the number of interactions overall and the type of interaction. So you have um, the annotations to the source document. So when somebody creates an original uh, message, and then how, how many um, subsequent messages get generated from that initial uh, annotation. So with Hypothesis, you can annotate on the document, and then you can also reply to other people's annotations. So we were interested in seeing how users um, you know, balanced their, their, their participation with regards to those, uh, those two types of messages. Uh, the second, the second focus that we did was uh, visualizing where on the document users would focus on. So with the Hypothesis uh, client, uh, client app, they can highlight uh, the text that they want to annotate. Um, and when, they, when there's more than one highlight on a specific part of the text, I think the, the, the shade gets a little darker, indicating that more people have highlighted. But what it's lacking is that you don't really get an indication of how many messages subsequent to that anchor to, uh, message is generated. So with this, uh, it's called a KDE uh, heat map. It's a kernel density estimation, one of the, one of the statistical methods that we talked about. Um, we can see how participants really focused on certain areas of the text. So we can get a sense of you know, which, which areas, what ideas, what topics uh, were popular, were, were, were important to the participants of this project. And I think um, Ramey described it pretty, pretty well when he said, if you think of the document as a, as a, you know, in a spatial sense, you kind of get a sense of um, where people are meeting. So I think I kind of like that. And then with the first finding, or excuse me, with the first uh, phase, uh, we also um, did very preliminary uh, social network analysis. Um, essentially, we just um, visualized it, uh, the interactions. So these are messages between users. And the larger the node um, meant, the more messages that that user created. Um, and this was a good way to kind of see which participants um, connected with, with whom. But we didn't really get any um, uh, quantifiable uh, metrics from this analysis until further on down the road when we started doing more uh, statistical uh, analytics. So for our second phase, uh, we really wanted to focus now more on that social network aspect of the research. Uh, because even though uh, Hypothesis isn't, isn't really uh, a social network, per se, um, the the marginal syllabus project was was in fact um, using it as that because people were interacting with one another, um, they were sharing ideas, they were building up up upon knowledge, um, and so using social network methods uh, really helped understand 
how that interaction was happening between participants. And um, the tools that we used for this uh, allowed us to not only um, generate what the structure of that conversation looked like, so what you're seeing now here is a, is a, is a diagram of a single conversation. So we defined conversations as annotations that had uh, a one reply or more. So we, we eliminated those annotations that never got replied um, just to reduce the noise. And we just focused on tech, on, on messages that would generate interaction with users. And so with the tools that we were using for that, we can start assigning uh, values to those nodes. So if you take, for example, um, here we have, we, 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 we used uh, features engineering um, to generate different uh, uh, values for what those nodes represent. So um, you could either just simply attribute uh, the usernames to the nodes, or we can um, assign the amount of time that trans transpired between a response. So when somebody posts their initial response, you can see uh, how much time passed between somebody actually responded to that res uh, first message, and then you can build um, the chain of what that looks like. And so um, this was a, a, an effort on our part in, to do um, inferential analysis to see um, what specific metrics um, would generate more responses. So um, for example, if um, somebody responded within you know, a certain number of minutes, would the first uh, user then respond back? That was something we were, we were looking at, if, if, if time passing was, had some sort of uh, inferential significance. Um, we did a study actually on um, sentiment analysis. So we were looking at um, taking the, the, the text of the message, uh, going through it, assigning a, a sentiment score, and seeing if somehow the, the sentiment of the, the message itself whether that um, created a response. So um, I, was, I was thinking perhaps that if somebody posted something to challenge your views, if the user who was felt challenged, if they were more likely to um, you know, respond to um, either defend their ideas or defend themselves. Um, but what we found is that some of the tools that exist out there um, are really, not really designed around this type of discursive uh, uh, products that's generated. So mainly the sentiment analysis tools that exist are for measuring sentiment for really basic state uh, statements like you know I, I I like Pizza Hut or I like or I hate Domino's. So applying those types of approaches to the text that gets generated uh, was 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 kind of challenging. Um, so we found that mostly the tool would only find um, neutral sentiment, and the the messages with more neutral m neutral sentiment would generate. Uh, like higher likelihood of a response, um, which I think was, uh, uh, like I said, a factor of just the tool that we used. So, and so now we moved on to the, the phase three of our of our research, and that was really the um, you know making our tools public, um, getting user user feedback, getting more participation to the analytics products that we're creating. Um, mainly as a, as a way to improve our, our analytics and hopefully get people more involved in this process. Um, this was the first version of uh, this dashboard. Um, you can see I'm not really much of a, of a designer, but um, the first, the, the top part had um, participation over time, so that temporal element, so the number of messages across uh, a, a calendar graph, essentially. And then we had um, just basic cursory um, analytics, like the number of participants, the number of days people actually annotated on, um, the number of annotations, so the, the anchor annotations and the number of replies generated by that. And then the, the third part of this document was a um, kind of like a kind of like a network graph of uh, users. Uh, and messages that they generated, so how those messages you know, looked in relation to one another. So this was basically an interactive view of this graph here. So this was, this was interactive, this was web-based, it was all in the browser. Um, 
and it was a way for people to actually start interacting with our with our analytics. And so, with our latest version of of, of this uh, dashboard, um, we've created a more uh, design focused um, system application that's uh, really really easier to use, easier to understand. Even though it's only um, cursory analytics, like uh, participation and um, and other things like that. Um, this is this is running in real time, so there's no um, there's no delay in what gets at, what gets displayed here between what gets posted. Um, this is running as a service, so if you have a specific document that you're interested in, um, this would pick it up the analytics for that. Um, it's not mobile optimized, so if you're trying to look at it through an iPad or an iPhone, it's not going to look very nice. Um, but because this was designed for the marginal syllabus. We hard-coded all the documents that we work with, and they are So we took more of a design approach to uh, building this app to make it a little bit more user-friendly and hopefully more people involved in this and pick it up and use it. We'll wrap things up here, but I'll just briefly mention that, again, in addition to summarizing and capturing and reporting some of the analytics about the Marginal Syllabus project, uh, this is essentially, as Francisco mentioned, an open service for any URL. And so we could take, for example, I think many folks are here familiar with, uh, fan of our bushes, as we may think, we can take that URL, which has, as we can see here, 207 hypothesis annotations, and we can actually bring it into the crowd layers. Um, service and we can actually begin to report the analytics of that conversation as well. We can look at the conversation threads and all of the participation analytics of any URL that's running open hypothesis conversation right now. Uh, so hopefully that would be of use to many other people in this room as well. So we'll wrap this up. I'll very briefly um, just return to our presentation to say that the work that we're doing, we hope, has some interesting implications for open uh, approaches to educator professional learning, particularly as a social practice that, again, is openly networked, interest-driven, and connected to everyday media practices, that we're interested in the notion of design, particularly as that concerns open learning environments and the ability to create multiple entry points to design both social and technical scaffolds and to encourage the spread of these types of models, particularly based upon participant interest and to design ultimately novel analytic methods to both create and help study these new forms of educator learning. So we'll be around for the rest of the day. Again, the link to crowd layers running live is in the agenda. Thanks so much for your time this afternoon. Hello, everyone. You're good. All right. Good afternoon. Um, it's kind of nice to go um, as a final presenter because they are really done. Like, paving the way for my discussion or the presentation really nicely. And uh, congrats on the work you've done. Um, for this talk, um, it's about web annotation in classroom as boundary place. And it's my first time at this conference. What I find is really fascinating in the past two days is we have a very diverse crowd here trying to tackle all kinds of challenges in in journalism, in scholarly communication, in education, all kinds of challenges. And we're expecting now, with, as educators, to fix all those challenges, right? <laughs> By educating better next generation, better than us. Um, but anyway, uh, a bit of introduction. I'm the assistant professor from the University of Minnesota uh, in learning technology. I self-identify as a learning scientist and also as an educational technologist. I have other kinds of informal titles like Rusty Java programmers uh, or uh, Advit annotator, which I like a lot, uh, which I'll talk about in this talk, actually. My research area includes a bunch of different stuff, including collaborative learning, learning analytics, and also MOOCs. But for this um, um, talk, there are three different things I want to quickly really go through so that we can have time for uh, discussion. The first is to talk about my personal experience with annotation. And the second is two different cases. One is more like down, the second is ongoing, which are both tied to web annotation. And finally, some musings about annotation in education. So before I do that, I want to kind of set the ground by referring to what John Dewey said or wrote around 120 years ago. Uh, he was criticizing the challenge or the waste in education 
which is the disconnection between experiences in classrooms and experiences outside the classroom. And he was pointing out that isolation of the school and the life or the true life for, of students is a big waste in education. And fast forward to now, we're in 2018, right? And there's a recent report coming out of a research foundation talking about crossing boundaries and talking about how experts and the public differ in terms of thinking about learning. What's fascinating is that um, the, the, the gap is wide, it's, it's dramatically wide. And sometimes we feel like tools and technology can fix this issue. But we've, what they found was it's really those hardest things to tackle are cultural models of learning, right? How we think about learning culturally and how we try to build this cultural model into tools we build, we get further, try to reinforce what we think about learning. So this is kind of what, what has been happening now and happening in the past few decades or a century. It's a really hard challenge for educators to tackle. It's really try to bring, bridge different kinds of contexts of learning, different parts of experiences of individual students and how we can do that now. And usually I don't make this kind of broad claim, but I think web annotation has a role to play in this very unique and challenging space. And for me, um, I grew up in China. Um, I study um, by transcribing my, my teacher's notes um, on the blackboard onto my textbooks. So this could be something you can find in my middle school textbook is all kinds of crazy notes and annotation I made on this textbook, which is basically transcribing what the teachers are trying to deliver in the lecture format. And in the meantime, I try to internalize, try to memorize, and try to review so that I can perform really well in, in my tests. And it get really worse in high school. <laughs> uh, so this is, some, this is not my textbook, but something that you, you will find on my textbook, actually. Uh, which we try to make this space useful and try to write everything down as I can on my textbook so that those are something really valuable for me as a, as a student at that time because they were important for my tests. And what's interesting is that you, can, you might ask the question, why don't you write down in a separate notebook? The, the reality is the textbook is a keen, right? In, the, in that kind of model of education, is the textbooks is everything. And what teachers are trying to deliver in lectures are additional valuable stuff I need to write down in this textbook so that I can go back and refer. So that's a different kind of annotating than what I'm doing now. Um, so what I'm doing now as a kind of educational researcher, we're talking uh, about this during lunch, is we annotate a lot because that's part of our job, even though we don't get credit for that. But in, in, in addition, uh, in order to research, to write, we have to annotate. So this is something that you can find uh, from my current workflow is I read stuff in a tool called Paper Pile, which is kind of equivalent to Mendeley, uh, but it's different, just kind of uh, different kinds of um, maybe ecosystem. So I annotate, I try to take notes. I, uh, in the process, I do try to sense make, critique, connect, and also conference with maybe the author virtually, not like re in real time. Uh, I also do something additional, which is to compile my annotation and try to synthesize, write a blurb to reflect on my highlights and my annotation, and then share that on my personal website. So this is something additional I do. And what's fascinating is a few weeks ago, there was a professor from Calgary writing to me through email saying, I'm in town, do you want to meet? I was just kind of really surprised because I don't know this person before. And when we met, um, he told me the story of seeing an annotation of his article a few years ago. And then he decided to use this annotation as the first reading of his class. So when he assigned his own article to the students, instead of assigning his article, he asked the student to first read my annotation because he was, was saying that this annotation process for scholars is super valuable and seeing me making sense of his article is making th him thinking about additional stuff. So, but this doesn't really get spotlight in this kind of scholarly com um, communication. 
So that's a long way kind of to tell this story. Uh, and also I use web annotation, special hypothesis to find serendipitous things online and connect to my research work. And the challenge I'm facing, or the struggle I'm facing, is how can I bridge this kind of annotation I did as a high schooler with this kind of interest-driven, inquiry-based, or discovery-oriented annotation I am doing right now. So it's kind of bridging the, myself from, I don't want to expose my age, but many years ago, and, and my current um, annotation. And, in addition, I think annotation is also about, it's not, also, it's not only about bridging annotation, but also bridging different kinds of learning, and different cultural models of learning. And in addition, different kinds of knowing. What does it mean to know, um, and what does it mean to annotate to know? So I'm really struggling here, so uh, it's a constant struggle, but I've, I've been trying to kind of tackle this challenge in my research and in my teaching. So let this move on, um, kind of transition to two cases I want to share um, uh, with two different kinds of roles I play as assistant professor. First is I teach graduates and undergraduate classes. And the first case is from my teaching. And the case, the title is called On LMS, uh, which Jeremy usually says anti-LMS, <laughs> which I think is different. Um, but anyway, um, as a professor, I wish to, to do something different. and and to do something not super always under the institutional um, mandate or institutional structure. So I choose to do something different by writing some open textbook or open educational resources by myself, just in the, as a part of my teaching. And in the meantime, try to engage students a bit differently, which is quite similar to what Michelle has been doing in Michigan as well. So this is a context. This is a course I taught um, last year as a purely online course, graduate level social analysis course. There were 12 active students and I wrote a basically open textbook online and there were around 2,000 visitors from all kinds of countries. Um, so the content I produced was public and open. What I did was every week I would sign uh, a chapter or two chapters from an online textbook that student can access through our libraries, and the student will annotate, and then which will critique, and then kind of discuss through hypothesis uh, on this textbook. Um, and also, I use Slack, right? and, and I realize uh, many folks in this room might use, also use Slack in all kinds of scenarios, but for us, was we're trying to use hypothesis for like sense-making, social annotation, and using Slack to do um, problem solving, collaborative inquiry, also kind of debate or sharing code or sharing uh, findings from social analysis among the students. So what I did was try to uh, kind of embed this hypothesis stream or annotation stream into Slack so that they get updated whenever there's a annotation made using this course hashtag. So there's kind of two different spaces we're trying to navigate how to cross the boundary between a private Slack space and an open public web annotation space. And then I try to embed this uh, annotation stream in our course website so that there's a ref review and, and synthesis, hopefully, stage that can happen in this course. Um, so kind of aggregation and also review. What's fascinating was so this is a really quick description of what we did, and the research has been published mostly about the design in, in a, tech, a tech journal called Tech Trends, um, which you can find in my slides from um, the program. What I realized was students had all kinds of interaction through two different tools. Um, they relied on Slack to do a lot of commenting, questioning, and um, kind of collaborative problem solving, and realize, and uh, relied less on hypothesis to do more social interaction, which is fine because they're designed for different purposes. And what I tried to, this is a, a different rendering of their activity, especially one student's activity. So on the right-hand side is the student's Slack posts 
and on the left hand side, those blue bubbles are uh, the student's annotation. And you can see the students, actually the red dot and the green dot, they're the same student, but different username in two different spaces. You can see this student is trying to seek connections and try to engage by posting all kinds of um, annotation or messages in two different spaces. And also you can see from the left-hand side, there are other kind of other students in the class interacting with the students by replying to the student's message. And what I'm trying to get at through this description is, for me, this case of um, LMS is try to kind of cross boundary and play with the boundaries between individual students and the community of the students in my class through web annotation. And in the meantime, as an instructor and also as a community, we're trying to play with this two different boundary between open web content, which students were annotating, and this private collaborative space which students use for their problem solving in this course. So this is something unique I think web annotation has been doing for me as an instructor in this specific case. And the second case I, I'm sharing is something totally different. Um, it's an ongoing research project. It's in the first year of its, uh, its end of this first year. It was funded by NSF, a National Science Foundation. It's called Idea Magnet. And it's grounded in uh, a few years of my work in a little community called Knowledge Building. But what's unique of, the, of this community was this community is building this pedagogy and technology called Knowledge Forum, try to support students to pursue their own ideas instead of reading a textbook, just like I did when I was in high school, uh, to understand or to acquire certain content knowledge. So what, what they're doing is start from the real ideas coming from the students, and then build around those ideas to seek out solution to authentic problems like the climate change, like how, why polar bears are, are disappearing, which students care about in, a lot in high school. And then they carry on this kind of collaborative discussion or discourse in this environment called Knowledge Forum. Um, and what we're trying to do um, is to support students' discourse in this private space and try to bridge their private space discussion with what's happening in the public space, like the public discourse right now, um, which could be connected to the climate feedback, right? Uh, the public debates on the news, um, those fact-checking sites, all kinds of efforts of people, all kinds of people are doing, and the student, unfortunately, they're usually less connected with those very important debates. So this, this project is try to connect them with this public, public space. So we're in the like, um, still active development right now, but the idea, basic design is, when students come into this discussion, after a, 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 an extended period of discussion, they try to um, create a bunch of magnets. Um, the reason of, of using this metaphor magnets is magnet will track all kinds of things and metals. Uh, and then uh, we're using this metaphor to mean that students are using this tool to um, attract pieces of information online that will help them advance their own ideas. So they come in and create a bunch of magnets and then they will seek out additional public online resources which could be, this case, is a polar um, bear tracking website. And then they will annotate. They annotate using this magnet, using hypothesis. And then, after doing that as a, as a community, they come back to this knowledge form space, and then the, the annotation will be rendered on the sidebar of knowledge form so that they can incorporate those annotation back into their private discussion to advance their, their inquiry, but using those kind of knowledge from the public space to support their inquiry. And they can also, hopefully, uh, this is in the roadmap, uh, identify open science data uh, and annotate using hypothesis, and then they can use something called CODAP uh, to do real world, uh, to analyze those kind of real world science data as part of the inquiry. Instead of analyzing some kind of toy data provided by the teacher or using secondary uh, resources for their learning, which is typical for now. So the idea, based on the description, is um, the second case is try to use web annotation to play with different boundaries, including 
similar to the first case, individual and community, because students have different interests, and, and play with the different interests between them is interesting. And also using web annotation to play with this kind of public discourse around science, and this private classroom discourse around science, how to bridge them. And more importantly, to, to, in, my, my, in, uh, in my opinion, is this is trying to boost the, uh, the authenticity, I cannot pronounce the word, authenticity, thank you, uh, in this classroom, so that, because we see that's challenging for students to think, them, think about themselves as scientists. That's a big challenge right now. Think of them as computer scientists, as a scientist. So this, hopefully, by bridging those different kinds of modes of learning and thinking and knowing, we can better prepare them to think about themselves as potential scientists or scientists right now. So that's something I think really fascinating. And web annotation, as you can see from this case, is playing a big role in this um, development work. So to me, to kind of quickly wrap up, web annotation is very important. It's about kind of boundary play. Uh, I don't want to get into the philosophical definition of what is a boundary play, um, but based on these cases you saw, uh, I think web annotation can do something in education to help way play help learners and teachers play with different boundaries, including different spaces, private classroom discourse, and public scientific debates, and playing with the boundary between different communities, um, and also the boundary of different kinds of identities. And hopefully that can make John Dewey a little bit happier in a, <laughs> in a few decades later, <laughs> um, or a few years later. A lot of things exciting going on, but I think here, uh, I'm trying to think what we can do with this specific concept and, and tool of annotation. And I'm super excited for this potential. So we have a few minutes for questions. I'm going to uh, take my role as uh, moderator, int introducer, and, and start the question and answers. Uh, there's really fascinating work to be done here. I think this is just the beginning of looking into the, to the data around student learning and, and leveraging learning analytics to learn more about that. But I'm, I know each of you guys also teaches with uh, collaborative annotation. And I'm wondering if you could just tell us a sort of simple anecdote about something that changed in a student during the course of you uh, introducing them to web annotation and having them use web annotation in the classroom. Um, I think I, I taught first year composition with social annotation and one of my students stands out to me um, and she was really hesitant to kind of talk back to the published authors and critique their rhetorical choices in the text um, and she could do that just fine when we looked at model student text but really it was hard for her to have that um, kind of critical conversation with an author about the choices they made because it was published and so that's something that stands out to me in terms of like how we can teach our students to approach annotation as a conversation where they do have some authority and can, even when it's, it's someone who is well respected in a the field, they can speak back to that author. I'll just briefly say, um, the last few semesters I've been beginning my courses by having students privately annotate the course syllabus. This is a way of one, literally teaching them how to use hypothesis. They can begin to, in a very low stakes way, annotate the syllabus just to get to learn the tool. They can, of course, then also ask questions of me about expectations, about clarity. Maybe I've made a mistake. It opens up a channel for, I think, more, dare I say, egalitarian discourse amongst an educator and the students in that particular class. And then it begins to create the social practices around annotation as one of inquiry, as one of multimodality. I really, Bodong, appreciate this idea of the kind of boundaries of playfulness. And I think that a kind of low-stakes environment maybe not a course reading, it's not perhaps an assignment yet, but the syllabus is a space to do so. And so as we move into the next academic year, I'm gonna to begin to put together some resources to encourage other educators to say, whether you're using an LMS or you're using a blog or you're working openly or privately, have your students annotate the syllabus as a way to teach them how to use the tool and to begin to enculturate them into a practice of annotation that then can then move forward in supporting other academic work. And to me, my teaching, I think having them annotate socially is what's super valuable is adding another chance of interactivity in my teaching. Instead of reading in their silos and come to this three hour session and talk, and some might be silent, there's another chance of talking through 
or interacting or sense making this dense article because we're reading like the really dense philosophical text sometimes and having this chance of interacting with peers is super valuable for my students. And we also had a rushed uh, lunch next door to get back in time here when we, because we were so engaged in conversation about each other's work. And so I wanted to give you guys a chance to ask each other questions if there's any or to continue that conversation if you want to. All right, or we can open it up to the, to the audience for the last 10 minutes here. Any questions for our education panelists? Thanks for a really great panel. Is that on? Um, so the, uh, my question was primarily for, 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 for Remy and, and Francisco. Um, it's really about the, uh, the switch between, and I was surprised by, by the figure, you know, uh, uh, replies to annotations were 72% as opposed to the annotations themselves. So can you talk a little bit about the quality of those uh, replies? Because to me that's something considerably differ different than an annotation. An annotation is a dialogue with the text by a reader. And suddenly you add another layer of, of dialogue. So it's a dialogue between those two readers. To what extent are they still referring to the text or are they referring to each other in terms of what kind of arguments they were making? So can you talk a little more, more about the quality of, of those replies? So in collecting those analytics, you take a, like a broad view overall of the participation. Um, and then with that view, then you can start actually digging into a more detailed uh, um, analysis. So um, from the broad view overall for the documents and the conversations, it was interesting to see using that network analysis tool, it was in interesting to see how certain conversations were shaped with regards to replies. So some conversations were maybe um, very narrow. So people would just respond to the first one and then nothing would come of it, right? And so we wouldn't analyze like what messages, what those messages were. And normally you would just have something that was very complimentary. Like, oh, I agree, oh, good point. You know, and that would typically never generate a response because I mean, how do you, what do you do to that? Just say maybe thank you, I guess. And thank you for your thank you and then you can just keep it. <laughs> But when you analyze the, the conversations that really had, uh, I guess, a long branch, then that's when you can actually start focusing more on, on the, um, the actual discursive analysis. And, and I think that's where Ramey uh, really used his expertise to actually um, you know, focus on what the participants were actually saying. So. Um, yeah, I mean, let me just make a kind of broad statement, Francisco, I really appreciate that, that part of our, one of our objectives in this research agenda, which is a complement, of course, to the marginal syllabus project primarily being about educator learning. That's our primary objective, but in terms of our work as researchers, one of the things that's been very productive about our collaboration is that Francisco's bringing these data analytics and machine learning perspectives to this corpus of open data and I'm bringing, from my own training, a very qualitative approach to looking at collaboration and, in this case, discourse. And so in looking at uh, some of our more recent uh, papers and publications, we are trying to bring in both, both that very data analytics, learning analytics side of analysis, as well as a deep look at when readers are no longer perhaps responding to the text, as you were suggesting, but responding to one another, what are they doing? Are they affirming one another's participation? Are they asking one another questions? Are they providing links to related resources? Are they uh, disagreeing? And in so helping to move a kind of productive but kind of contested conversation forward. And in one of our deeper analyses of a, a, a larger corpus of conversation amongst educators, we've actually given these discursive moves a name. These are all the replies, again, to your question. And we've been calling that uh, sublimates. That's an acronym for a variety of social practices that kind of become amazing in their use despite being kind of everyday media literacy practices. And I'm happy to share that with you as well. Hey guys, um, I'm wondering, um, as you start to collect these analytics and you know, you're measuring things about time and 
you know, where annotations happened, what kind of modality they're in, and so forth. Um, and maybe this connects back to the last question. How, where, as educators, where have you started to connect the patterns that you're seeing in the analytics to the patterns that you know and understand and are looking for for learning? Does that make sense? I think each of you could maybe add, say something about that. Um, um, so I, I can, I'm kind of in the community of learning analytics, what's going on in that community, a big debate um, is aligning, not debate anymore, I think it's a, co a common uh, understanding is aligning learning design with learning analytics is hugely important because we enter into the data without a perspective of what's intended Right, what's intended educative goals of this. Without that understanding, it's hard to interpret the data in a meaningful way. So if I, as an instructor, I can enter this analytics uh, with my understanding of the pedagogical um, learning design information, I can realize, okay, the student didn't annotate this super important part of this, this reading, um, and I wonder whether they reached that level in the reading or there's less, um, there's a bit confusion here and there, so I can kind of design and adjust my teaching responsive to this analytics. And this all comes to this distinction I want to make between analytics of learning and analytics for learning. I think what they are doing is super cool is they're making that live and usable, useful for everyone who are participating into this discourse, so hopefully there could be opportunities for uh, those educators they can come in and see the dashboard and then this could be hopefully informing their decisions uh, when they're participating into this conversation. And we can add. Yeah, I, which also means that eventually this kind of data set can be surfaced to a student about their own reading habits and then they can yeah. align that with their success or, or not or leverage it in different ways. I think that, you know, Michelle and I had a really lovely conversation yesterday actually about the fact that, you know, Particularly, and I'll just say, in, in a K-12 space, the use of data can become a very slippery slope towards becoming a, almost policing of activity and a kind of rationale for this student gets an A and this student doesn't pass a class. And, and I think that, you know, Francisco emphasized really nicely in our talk the need to be accountable to individuals who are voluntarily, in this case, contributing data that we're then using for research and how we can create these public-facing tools that allow us to not just put everything out there. And Francisco also mentioned when we were speaking over lunch that we're just scratching the surface in terms of, again, what we're able to share from data that's being gathered from the Hypothesis API. And so when you look at crowd layers right now, we're trying to highlight aspects of collaborative activity. So one aspect of that is activity over time and how conversations grow. A second is the threads, the conversations themselves. We can see how those replies to replies do develop in substantive ways. And then also, in this case, looking across multiple texts. And it actually came up in the workshop this morning about creating linkages across multiple documents to strengthen community conversation. And as Francisco said, we've kind of hardwired in all of the various texts and documents that are specific to the marginal syllabus project but by making this an open service for others, you could create your own crowd layers dashboard and either hardwire in your own URLs and documents, or again, use the search function on any URL to get a sense of the collaborative activity that I think to Bodong's point is talking about the use of these analytics about learning processes and not just for the sake of generating data, for the sake of generating data. I hope, I hope Nate, that gets at what, what you're hopefully asking. Yeah, thumbs up, okay. All right. And that was exactly going to be my question, is basically the reflection that Michelle and uh, Fernando and then Khalil, and I'm not sure about Bodong, have made with showing the data that you're collecting back to the people who are generating. Is it changing their minds? Is it, you know, so I, I come from two communities, both the quantified self community where people are saying, okay, I want to learn about my own practices. And, and expose my own practices to myself in ways I never could before. But also as a software developer, boy, we're instrumenting all kinds of things about our own behavior and, and looking at our, 
our practice and say, hey, um, let's make our practice better. Yeah, I mean, I, with the retrospective Think Aloud protocol, I was able to really sit down and, and let my participants reflect and see their reading practices and think about the ways that they were making meaning. And they all reported that it was really eye-opening for them. And we're talking about doctoral students who are studying literacy, who are English teachers, who are readers and writers, and we're finding that they were still able to think about ways to improve their practice by looking at that. Now, we didn't have the kind of analytics that you know my colleagues have, um, but, but just being able to take a step back and look at their practices, I think, is really important. Um, but I, I like that human sense-making element, too, which I think my colleagues are trying to incorporate even as they're creating these numerical data sets or the social network analysis. There's still this human qualitative element that I think is really important to understanding the social practices around annotation. Any other questions for our panelists around annotation in education? Or any other suggestions on how to improve our, our dashboard? <laughs> Michelle, you mentioned that, actually, I think more than one of you, but I remember Michelle mentioning that her students were a little bit uh, wary of annotation in some ways, uh, maybe specifically speaking back to the publisher or speaking back to the author, or maybe just sharing it amongst their peers, or. Do you think that, I mean, they're going to be presenting, they're going to be creating lots of written works ab about other works. Is there some qualitative difference between writing a paper about something and annotating it to them? Do you see, does it feel like there is, they feel a barrier in that, maybe the intimacy or whatever it is of the annotation, the act of annotation as opposed to the act of literary analysis or commentary or whatever? Is there is some difference, I suppose, is the question. Yeah, I think so. And, and one thing I would add is that, you know, even thinking about um, how a conversation gets extended and what, at what point it leaves the text, um, that I really try to work on with my students is thinking about the audience of their annotations. It's, it's their future selves, but it's also their classmates. So they're, they're not necessarily speaking directly to the author anymore, but they're, they're creating annotations that Ideally, when we're, we're sharing them in hypothesis, the audience is really their peers. And that's a different kind of annotation. And sometimes my students struggled with that. So I had some students who took like an AP language class and were reading in a composition course. And they thought they were being really smart by using terms that I didn't even quite know to label parts of a text and label rhetorical strategies. But their annotation was one or two words in length. And it, it didn't do anything. And it didn't go anywhere. And so I think there's that piece of recognizing the audience and adapting your annotation for the audience, knowing that it's okay for it to be kind of speculative in nature. It doesn't have to be a fully fleshed out thought like you need in your paper, but a question is great there because I think that's what, I don't know what you guys found really generated conversations, but what I saw was people invited conversation from their peers by asking questions about text or admitting where they didn't have expertise. What does it mean then to, and I'm not saying that you're doing this, but I've thought about doing this, uh, to take that informal interaction with text or, or content and, and classmates and formalize it by, you know, sending it to the grade book of the LMS or putting a grade on it or evaluating that, then that thing becomes as, as formal as the final paper. And is that? Yeah, I, yeah that's, Jeremy, that's a great point. I've, I've kind of steered away from uh, grading annotations in that kind of very discrete sense. Um, I suppose with my students, and I've been incorporating hypothesis annotation publicly in various private groups and various kinds of documents now, I, I guess for five to six semesters now, but in, which, which is just all to say that I think to, to, to your question, um, I've, I've needed to do a better job as an educator defining for my students the fact that hypothesis annotation or open annotation or digital annotation, however we choose to frame that, and talk about that serves very different purposes even in a single course depending upon the purpose of a given assignment or the given community of people that they happen to be working with. So being much more explicit with my students about the use of annotation as peer-to-peer -peer feedback on you know, draft documents versus moving into an open space where students are potentially speaking back to authors of blog posts or articles online 
versus more informal conversation about a shared reading. Those are three very different reasons to pick up and integrate something like hypothesis into teaching. And I think that honestly, a lot of the onus is on me to do a better job of modeling and being explicit about those, those different contexts of use. I just want to add that uh, I tweeted maybe this morning or yesterday about what, what I really like about the education mission of Hypothesis is they try to, or you guys try to, empower students to produce knowledge. So it's the word produce instead of acquire, right? That's a big difference which try to recognize the value produced by annotation itself. It's a value, value generation process instead of something additive to uh, or something subordinate to another goal. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>